CEO of Gazelle System, creator of the Rhythm Software, and author of Execute Without Drama. Patrick's an award-winning international speaker and a serial entrepreneur who has started and exited several multi-million dollar companies. His prior company was 151 on the Inc. 500 list, and he's a winner of the North Carolina Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. On our webcast today, Patrick's going to teach you how to use 90-day critical number to increase sales, hire great people, and generate cash. Uh, Patrick, it's great to be with you here today. Hey, Ryan, thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> thank you, everyone, who's uh, joining us on the webcast. Uh, it's very exciting. I think we actually have um, the, the most number of people on this webcast to date. We have no more than 100 people signed in. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's get into talking about critical numbers. Um, oh, let me see if you're seeing this. Yeah, I think we're seeing your presenter. There we go, Patrick. That's great. Perfect. Okay, cool. So, uh, so, so here's why I care about critical numbers. You know, first question I've got to ask you is, have you ever had the situation where you seem to have a business goal or problem that just wouldn't budge, no matter how hard you seem to push. You know, sales didn't go up, no matter how hard you worked. Cash didn't fall, no matter how hard you were Able to hire those 10 quality resources that you've already sold to your clients, but you haven't hired yet. And every day that you don't hire those people, uh, you're losing the opportunity for revenue. So, those I call those big boulders. And if you've ever had that feeling, then you relate to this image of this poor lady trying to push that huge boulder. Um, and just, it, just, it just won't move. So today I want to share with you a few stories and some tips on how to use critical numbers to move that boulder, to move that huge, huge rock. So let's start with Jack, uh, Jack Stack to be exact. And uh, let's talk about his huge boulder. So give you a little bit of background on Jack Stack, who's kind of considered the father of open book management by by all, and, and uh, he has his, his, um, his book, Great Game of Business, is a, is a long-time classic. So Jack came to work for International Harvester as a plant manager in 1979. Fortunately, a few years later, in 1983, International Harvester was not doing well and started closing plants. And Jack and his team could see the writing on the wall that it was just a question of time where, uh, where his team would get shut off as well. So Jack and his team did a very brave thing, right? They did something called a leverage buyout, an LBO for short, and they bought the company. They bought the plant, actually, and the plant became SRC. So what SRC does today is they manufacture gasoline and diesel engines and various engine component parts, kits, and things like that. So they bought this plant with a huge loan from a bank, and it really was a really bad loan. And how do we know it's a bad loan? Well, Jack, when Jack told me his story, he said, you know, we got this loan, the, um, the bank officer that gave me the loan, was actually fired before the loan actually closed. So on the day that I actually got the money, that gentleman who sold, who, who closed the deal for me, uh, was no longer there to give it to me. And when the loan started, he had a debt to equity ratio of 89 to one. And I think it doesn't take a finance geek to know that a debt to equity ratio of 89 to one is really a bad thing. So his, his big boulder in that case, and his first one, was terrible, terrible financial health. They were so over leveraged on the first day that the company really should have died. In fact, it took him many, many banks. You remember him telling me, Patrick, I had to find a bad bank, a bank that was dumber than me, a bank that was so bad that it would actually give me a loan this bad. So on the very first day, they got the loan, they bought the company, they bought the plan, they started the company, and they were already over, over leveraged. So what did Jack do? Well, Jack did a few things, and to summarize it, first he focused on a key metric. He called this a critical number. And he used this critical number to bring the company back to financial health. And in this case, his house was burning, and it was the debt-to-equity ratio. Now, the debt-to-equity ratio is the leading indicator of whether financial health is trending upwards or downwards. If the debt-to-equity ratio continues to increase, that means your financial health is getting worse. If it, it goes downwards, uh, then it means your, your financial health is getting better. So the second thing he did after picking a critical number was he had to help the team start with small wins to move this number because this is a really huge number to move. So they would start with some small wins, educate them along the way, give them the sense of the big picture. So you don't want to lose the, um, the forest from the trees. And then the third thing he did was he educated the team on the numbers. You know, what is exactly a debt to equity ratio and how does it actually move? What are the things that actually move it into the right positive direction? 
So this clarity and focus helped him move his flaming boulder with a series of small wins. So, uh, and so how, how to, up to what I call today big wins. So how big are his wins? Well, SRC went from a struggling single plant in 1983 to a company today, a holding company today with more than 18 companies, doing more than 300 million and more than 1,000 plus employees. So that's, uh, that, but his very first start, he had to solve that flaming boulder. So what's your boulder? You know, what's in your way uh, that's causing you sleepless nights? And, and I want you to just write the, down the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay, so just write down the first thing that comes to your mind. What's your boulder? The next thing sometimes is that this boulder sometimes that's in your way could also be about increasing the capacity of your company. Uh, sometimes it could be that you have a barrier to your sales that if you don't fix, you can't increase your sales. And so Sometimes this boulder is about getting the right skill set and increasing the capacity so you can actually achieve the sales goals. And I want to share a very quick story. Uh, one of my clients, Costopia. Costopia is an internet services company that works with large telecoms firms to service small, medium-sized businesses who want to use the internet to get leads and sales. And uh, they were facing this challenge a few years ago. When they take on a new telecoms partner, they have to migrate a massive number of websites over to their platform. And so a few years ago, they maxed out at about 10,000 sites a quarter. And um, the CEO called and said to me, you know, Patrick, this severely limits our ability to take on large partners because when we take on larger partners, they want us to migrate a lot more sites and we just can't do it. We just can't do it. So, so it doesn't really matter. We just cannot increase our sales or we will fail. They needed a huge breakthrough. They needed to just crush this boulder. So here's what they end up doing. First, they, they, they discussed in length and they decided that they really had to increase their capability of migrating sites. So they wanted to, to move to the ability to migrate between 12,000 and 15,000 sites a quarter. And they've never done that before, right? The most they've ever done up now is about 10,000 sites a quarter. So they made this a critical number, number of sites migrated. It was a leading indicator on how much they could actually sell and actually deliver. So the single decision led them to work on improving skills and core processes because when he started asking the question, okay, on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, how do we punch through this barrier of 10,000 sites and do 12 to 15, they began to realize that actually they had to work on some skill sets, they had to work on some processes in order to get their breakthrough. And so uh, what's amazing is that they broke through and that quarter they did 15,000 sites. Now, we call that super green in our language. You know, green is the goal, 12,000, and 15,000 is super green. They really, they really blew through their goal. It was great. But more importantly, what was a small victory there was the ability to continually improve the process of migrating websites. So that was a few years ago. Today, today they can migrate more than 100,000 websites a quarter. And, uh, and today they are signing big, big deals. They're the leader in the industry. Uh, and so that was because they were able to move that boulder and also improve their processes and their skill set all at the same time. So what was your boulder just now? And I want you to think about this again now that you've heard two stories. Are there any other boulders? And would the first boulder that you picked, would that be the right one? Or is there something else that you have that would give your company long-lasting impact and skills uh, just, like, just like Hostopia? And so today what I want to do is that I want to just share with you three keys to helping you design and use critical numbers. And along the way, I'll put in some best practices and some pitfalls to avoid based on some real-life examples of our clients. Uh, this is the tool that Ryan asked you to download just now. Uh, this is my gift to you today. It's, I hope it's a simple one-page tool to help you just think through how to use critical numbers, how to design it. And we're going to use it today in our short, uh, short time together. So the first key is to make it the main thing. So you want to make sure that your, your, your critical number is about the most important thing for the quarter. And uh, Stephen Covey says, you know, begin with the end in mind. So what is your main thing? You have to begin with the end in mind. And let me give you some practical tips on discovering what your main thing is. The first is, if you have a crisis, look no further. It's your main thing. I still remember a planning session I did years ago. I walked into a client. I had this whole process that I'm going to show you on coming up with their theme and critical number and what the whole quarter is about. I walked in and the client said, Patrick, we don't have to have that discussion. We have a crisis and therefore here is what we need to focus on. Look no further. And so that gave me an extra hour to help them think through that crisis. So 
if you have a crisis, don't overthink it, okay? Your crisis is the main thing. So back to the Jack Stack story in the, in the very first, uh, uh, first slide, uh, Jack Stack had a crisis, right? He didn't have to do any more analysis or mental gymnastics to go, dude, you know, if we don't fix this debt to equity ratio, we are going to die. If we don't get financial health, we are going to die even though we just got born. So when you have a crisis, look no further. Hopefully we don't have a crisis. If you don't have a crisis, or hopefully you solve your crisis and now you're, you're in, in a good business, you, you, you don't have a crisis on your mind. Well then here are a couple of things that you want to take a look at. Three steps. The first is you want to open up your mind for ideas and consider the various possibilities. And so I like to consider what are the opportunities and threats that a company has in front of it over the next 12 months. Uh, I like to do a start, stop, keep exercise, and, and this will help you kind of bring out, bring out what's, what in your, what's in your, your, your key, key team's heads and minds. Um, what are your key initiatives for the year? Have you made a push on those key initiatives enough so you'll have a successful year? When you look at your one page strategic plan, about 60% of you use that. What's in your three-year key thrust? Have you made any headway in your three-year key thrust? And in your, in your, in your three-year, three to five-year plan, is it a thrust that you have to figure out, or is it a skill you have to figure out? Uh, have you made progress there? If not, these are some things you may want to consider. So step one is open up for ideas, and, and, and I actually want to point out two very quick tools here. One is the opportunities and threats. I don't see a lot of teams doing this all the time. Uh, I like to ask teams to come to their planning sessions with the top five written down, right? So step one is come prepared. It's top five written down. It will save you some time. Look at a 12-month horizon. Secondly, share it. Share it, go around the table, share it. Everyone gets to put two of the top five on the wall, on a tear sheet on the wall. And then third is I would vote and see what intelligence of your team takes you and get down to the top three. On the start, stop, keep again, I'll do something very similar. It's a very similar process. Prepare your team to come to the meeting with this written down. You know, what are your top three starts? Starts are things that uh, you're not doing today that you should consider doing. Stops are things that are not working, not valuable, um, and you should be hassle your firm and stop doing that. Jim Collins, by the way, author of Good to Great, says that what's more important than your doing list is your stop doing list. So, you know, if you stop doing some things that are not valuable, it will make room resource-wise for you to work on the things which are very valuable. And then the keeps are the things that are working, they can learn from. Very similar process. You know, first come with, a, come with your stuff written down, then share it, pick a top two, put it on the wall, vote, and then get it down to your top three. So now you've got those. You've got your start, stop, keeps, opportunities and threats. You narrow it down to your top three key initiatives, three year key thrusts. Now you can have a discussion, vote, and get it down again to the top three topics. And you finally have debate and discussion, and you come up with the main thing. Now, that sounds like a long process, but think about it. You're about to deploy the resources of your company for the next 90 days, right? It's a 13-week race. And so, yes. It's going to take time, and if you slow down now and take that time, you will do much, much better. So get your main thing. Now, some of you in the audience, you know, you've got 60% of us familiar with the critical number, 50% of us use it, and 60% of us use the Rockefeller Labs one page strategic plan. So I'm sure that some guys in the audience are saying, okay, Patrick, that sounds simple enough. So how come it didn't work for me? <laughs> so I wanted to share with you a couple of reasons I've seen why sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, and here are the usual suspects. So if I didn't cover the usual suspect, you know, write it down, ask the question, please. Uh, first is, we did not agree on what the main thing should be. So we had a very quick meeting, we had a very quick discussion, and, you know, we kind of got that main thing shoved down our throats. So, uh, you know, CEO decided that was the most important thing, but we didn't fully understand it, we didn't really, you know, agree on it, but that's our main thing. So unfortunately, we really had to slow down to get people to agree on the main thing. Um, so we lost in this case before we even got out of the gate. That's the first reason and the biggest reason why I see a lot of critical numbers not working. The second reason is we got a critical number, but we did not do much beyond that, and so nothing happened. Yep, I'm sorry to say, it ain't auto magic. I'm sorry. Once you got your critical number, you got to have a plan of attack, your execution plan on what you're going to do to actually achieve your goals. The critical number isn't magic. The critical number should focus and align your team to do what, right? So what are you going to do, not your focus and align on the critical number? Then the third reason that I've seen lots of times is that the critical number used was not a leading indicator. It did not actually point to what causes us to move the boulder a little bit easier. 
it actually pointed mainly to the result. And lots of times, sometimes, you know, a result as a critical number, that could work too. But what usually works better is a leading indicator that points you to the cause or, or, or the root, not actually uh, the result itself. So I want you to think of your critical number as a very strong lever, right? It acts as, as a lever to help you move a much, much bigger weight with a little bit of weight, right? So you can move a huge boulder with less effort. Quick story here on, 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 on cash. One of our clients a few years ago, uh, growing quickly, software company, they kind of met the first law of entrepreneurial growth, which is growth sucks cash. And I'm sure you heard different versions of this story before. Sales is going up, cash is coming down, um, but everything looks good otherwise. Uh, but if we run out of cash, we die. I'm freaking out. I'm not sure what to do. And the more he looked at his bank balance, the more he freaked out. Because every day, sales is going up. Backlog's doing good, by the way. Business backlog's getting bigger. But cash is going down. And, and he, didn't, he only had about six months more left of cash. So how many of you can think when you are freaking out? Because this poor client of mine, he was freaking out and he really couldn't think. So the first step, if you're in this situation, I would suggest, and in this story is exactly what I shared with this gentleman, was to chill. When I said that, he kind of laughed. Because you have to chill. You know, when you feel the constriction in your throat or chest, you just need to chill. Because you can't think if you don't chill. And then um, we use the six thinking has to think through the problem by partitioning the conversation and explore ideas to get down to the root. We have to figure out what was the cause of the cash going down. And I'll share with you uh, this six thinking has format in, the, in my next slide. And then, then they found that there were a couple of different main things that could help them move this huge boulder. And they debated and they decided that the main thing that they were going to work on was that their installations were late. And because they were paid lump sums upon delivery, when their installations are late, it actually does not allow the customer to pay them. But it does something interesting too. When, it, when the installations are late, um, the backlog actually goes up because they didn't get paid. So they're looking at the backlog thinking it's actually a positive thing because, hey, you know, our backlog keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger but actually was a negative thing because the backlog was getting much bigger, not only because of sales, but because of delivery that was stuck in the pipe. So be very careful. Metrics are good, KPIs are really key, but be very careful uh, because sometimes if you look at a KPI and you're using incorrectly, what looks really positive can give you a false positive. In this case, it was giving them a false positive. So the critical number became very simple. It was the number of installations to deliver on time for the quarter. The number of installations done with the leading indicator and the lever to actually getting cash unclogged. Um, by the way, they took that one quarter, they moved that boulder, they doubled the bank balance from a half a million to a million dollars in the bank. And then they were able to breathe much better. So um, the, the, the key lesson to take away from here is what actually moved that boulder for them, right? In their case, it was the, it was the cause was installations of the software not being done on time. So what is it for you? What is the cause that could help you move your boulder? So here's the six thinking hats. I wanted to just share this book with you. It's a very easy read. Please go get it. The cool thing about the six thinking hats is that it's about partitioning your, con your conversation and your discussion. So typically, a typical pitfall to brainstorming idea generation is that as soon as we start discussing an idea, somebody will say why it doesn't work or how to make it work. We start working on the idea, dissecting it, instead of getting more ideas. But in brainstorming, you really want to keep the ideas coming, even the bad ones, because oftentimes it takes the bad ones for a good one to emerge and stand on the back and shoulders of the bad ones. So, uh, so why it works is that the rules are very simple. Secondly, it partitions your conversation. And third, everyone knows that somewhere in the discussion, they will get an opportunity to black hat an idea or to love on an idea. So you can create your own discussion format, but here's a very simple one that's worked for many discussions that I've done. We start with the goal, and that's the blue hat of organization. And then once we know what the goal is, I always want to know what's the value to us. Why do we care? Like, if, if this thing, if we achieve this goal, what does it mean to our company? How, how great can it be? So what's the value to us? Thirdly, what are the facts? So before we start talking about stuff, what do we actually know for a fact? Not opinions, but facts. And then let's go into idea generation. And when we do idea generation, Let's make sure that all we do is come up with ideas. We're not dissecting the idea. We're not talking about why it works or why it doesn't work. We're just throwing ideas on the board. 
After that, we go into what I call intuition, or the, or the red hat of emotion and intuition, and, for, and, and give people an opportunity to kind of speak passionately about the two or three ideas on the board that they love. Which one do you actually love? Which one do you actually think works? And then sell that to us. And then you go to the black hat section. Of the ones that we've shortlisted, which ones don't work? Which ones are hard? Which ones are expensive? Which ones are risky? And then once you've had all that discussion, let's organize, vote, summarize, and choose your best ideas. This format can take you anywhere from you know, 30 minutes to an hour to get through a discussion in a high quality fashion. So, really cool method, think about using it. Um, let's get back to the idea of, of, of having discussions. So, so some of us are afraid, I found, that when we have different opinion with each other, we're afraid of a discussion. And, and really we shouldn't be, you know, if, if we all have the same opinions, then some of us, unfortunately, are cost-saving opportunities. So instead, we should celebrate the fact that we have different opinions, and we should use the different opinions in the debate to discuss and get the best solution. So Liz Wiseman uh, had this book come out last year. It's been making a very strong impact on, on a lot of my clients to get them to ask more questions, and, and also it talks about uh, the importance of actually debating the issue. So we've got to debate. We've got to debate, then we've got to choose, and then we've got to agree on the main thing. So. Uh, some techniques here, when you, when you think about the debate here, is uh, there are no losers. Because one of the reasons why debates may be difficult is I feel like I am arguing with you, and if, if you win, I lose. Right? So one, one, uh, one thing I've found that, that makes it a lot easier for people to share their different opinions and debate is to make the statement that there are just no losers in this room. There's going to be no losers. You know, because it's not the humans who are debating who lost. It's the topic that lost. Which is great, because if you've got two or three topics to discuss, you have to, can you choose one? You want to figure out which are the losers so you can pick out the winner. So it's the topic that is the loser, not the human. And you can also modify the six thinking hats, or you can use the six thinking hats for deep discussions and debate. So here's how you do that. First, the topic. Then the facts. What do we know for a fact? What are the data we can show? Then let's argue for. So those of you who think that this is a great idea, this topic, let's, let's, let's argue for. Then next, let's argue against. Why should we not do it? Okay, let's, let's argue against. And then someone who loves that topic, give us a pitch for why you still love it after everything was said and done. Do that for each of the three finalists for your main thing. It takes maybe 20 minutes each. And again, I know some of you in the room may be going, oh my gosh, Patrick, are you crazy? That's like an hour and a half. Yep, but you're going to spend a whole quarter on this thing. It's going to be a critical number. Um, so take the time and then choose and agree. By the way, Agree does not mean buy-in, okay? Agree is that we all, after the debate, we are all convinced it's the right thing. There's a huge difference between someone buying in or giving in versus someone agreeing that, that, uh, that this is something that we should all do. So you use, if you take a look at the tool that I gave you, um, the first part up top is what's the main thing for your quarter or year? So I've kind of documented very quickly the four-step method there. If it's a crisis, it's obvious. Otherwise, open up your ideas, narrow it down top three, and then debate and get the main thing. So on the, left, on the right side, you can list your top three to five ideas, right? Have your debate, come up with the main thing, and make sure you write down what is the positive impact to your company. Because we all have to remember, when we're fighting in the trenches, we all have to remember why we care. And the impact to a company is what helps us think about why we care. Okay, so Ryan, I think it's a good time. I've just went through one key. I've got two more keys to go. Uh, are there any questions that have been typed in that, that uh, uh, and, if, and if you haven't typed in anything, now is a great time to type in a question. I'll pause for a minute so I can take any questions. Yes, I have a question uh, from Karen. While I'm asking this question, uh, uh, others from the, the attendees have, a, have questions. Please type those in the questions now while we're answering a couple that have already been sent. I have a question from Karen. She wants to know, what if people don't seem excited about the main thing? What do we do about that? So I get that a lot. Uh, what if people don't seem excited about the main thing? And um, there's no magic bullet here. You know, you kind of have to back up and make sure you have done a good job on the education, the discussion, the debate. Because if we've debated this deeply and clearly and we've chosen and agreed, we will be excited. So, so if people are not excited, it usually means a few things. One is that we didn't explore the other things I liked enough. And by the way, I don't need you to do what I say. I just need to feel heard. 
So I'm not excited because I felt like I didn't get heard. Um, or second reason why I'm not excited is um, uh, is I don't quite understand how my job, me personally, how I can participate and contribute to the main thing. I'm having difficulty there. And that's the other reason why people don't get excited. So um, if someone isn't excited about the main thing, go ahead and try and figure out, you know, what is it about, ask them, you know, in your job, what do you think you can do to actually impact the main thing? And then you need to have a discussion that will help them discover some opportunities. Thanks, Patrick. We've got another question here. Uh, how much information should we share? Our company is nervous about uh, disclosing information. So how much information should we share with everyone? Okay. So that's a really hard question to answer without knowing the company. Uh, but uh, I would say this. I would say that you want to share as much information necessary for the person to get the job done. I know that sounds really obvious, but it's really hard to get me excited and to understand how to contribute to the main thing for me not to understand in the data behind it. Now, I'm not saying you have to be an open book management firm. So I'm not saying you have to share all the numbers. I'm just saying that you have to share enough information so that I can understand what impacts the main thing so that I can be a brain for you as well to figure out what I can do to impact the main thing. And I got one more question. Uh, can you give some examples uh, for critical numbers, some specific examples, either now or later in the webcast, whichever they come up? Actually, that's a, that's a good question. I'm going to give you a couple more examples later on, so hold on to that question, okay? I'm actually going to go, my next key is actually about, about the critical number leading indicators. Okay. And several people are inquiring how to get the, uh, the tool that we just showed them. Let me just remind you again, Any you other can download that tool from... Uh, yeah, I got one more thing to point out about the uh, the tool. Lots, lots of people okay. are trying to find the tool. So let me. Um, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to move on. Uh, key number two. Key number two is about using a. I think we may have lost uh, Patrick's audio. If, uh, can you hear me as the host? I can tell from your your questions you can't hear Patrick, but you can hear. Okay, it sounds like you can hear me, but not Patrick. So stand by for just a minute, and we'll see uh, what we can do to get Patrick's audio back on. And while we're waiting for Patrick's audio to recover, uh, for those of you that were asking where to get the critical number tool, you can download that from the Gazelle Systems website, gazellesystems.com. There is a webcast link there, and you can download the, uh, the critical number tool from there. Oh, Patrick, you're back. We lost your audio hey, for Ryan, about I'm sorry. the last uh, 15. We lost your audio for about the last 15 seconds. So uh, if you can start again right after the question slide, that would be very helpful. Okay, sorry about that. So you can hear me okay now, right? I can hear you this time, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I, I kind of lost your audio, so I didn't know whether you died or I died. <laughs> so uh, what, I was gonna, what I was gonna do was get to the second key. And the second key is to use a leading indicator. And I, and I showed you this image before already of, of, the, of the lever where the small little green weight moved that huge big weight, right? So let's talk about that. And then somebody had a question about, about um, give you examples of critical numbers. So we're going to get into that as well right now. And so here's an example of, of one of our clients. They had a phenomenal business opportunity. But in order to make that business opportunity work, they had to hire about 14 people. So they were losing money every day but not having the key people hired. So the big boulder, just to be very clear, is not to hire 14 people. The big boulder is the opportunity. But to move that opportunity, you've got to have 14 people hired. Now, the easy answer here would be to say, let's make hiring 14 people the critical number. So critical number is hire 14, and green is 14. Okay? But if you dig deeper into the, into the recruiting process, 
what the client knows about the process is that they have a very good process where the final interview with the three candidates uh, is what really makes the hiring work correctly. So uh, they then decided that actually they shouldn't be focusing on the 14 people. What they should really be focusing on is to get three final candidates for every position that they need to be hired. So they really need 42 final interviews with 42 different candidates. And so that critical number that they chose this for this uh, project of this big rock was uh, number of final interviews. And that was the critical number that they used for that quarter. So they also knew, by the way, they also caused them to examine the process because the so stress on hiring that they did not enforce the 42 interviews, they, could, they probably would have compromised and hired poor people, which would be worse, right? In other words, if you focus on hiring 14 people, we'll hire 14 people. They might be crappy people, but we hire 14 people. Instead, they said, okay, part of our process is we know we've got to get three great candidates to hire one, and so we're going to focus on getting 42 great candidates in the final interviews, all right? And that way, they actually improved their process as well. Um, so, so in this case, uh, that critical number was number of final interviews. The typical mistake I see people make is, again, we stop too early in our quest for the critical number. You know, we kind of have the desired outcome and we move, we move on. So instead of doing that, get your desired outcome clearly and ask yourself what causes it. And then kind of peel the onion back and ask yourself, you know, why, what I call the Q5, five questions on why and how. You know, why, what causes that? How does it work? What causes it? How does it work? Why is it important? And if, after you've asked yourself about five of these questions, I notice that you get, you pretty much get to your critical number. And, and sometimes you can stop after four, but you know, four to five whys and hows will help you uh, get to your critical. So if you take a look uh, over here to the, the, the process of designing a critical number, um, what is the result and then what is the leading indicator? So again, be, begin with the end in mind, right? What is the desired outcome? And then what is the result? How would you actually measure the result? And so it's, it's a key point here to make sure that the result is measurable. And then ask yourself, to find a leading indicator that she helped you cause that result. Also, be careful here not to pick a critical number that is too esoteric, too hard to understand. Uh, sometimes I see teams come up with critical numbers that are a combination of two or three things. And I've got to do some math every day to figure out your critical number. And that's not going to work very well. So keep your critical number very simple, very easy to understand. But what I always say is a two-digit IQ critical number works much better than the three-digit IQ critical number. Okay, so the next step is the red, yellow, green. And red, yellow, green is about having success criteria. I'll give you a very simple example in the, in, the, in the hiring example I used just now. So green is the goal. Green would be 42 final interviews. Red would be what is considered to be unacceptable performance, failure. And in this case, they wanted to hire 14. If they hired less than 10, it would be unacceptable. So 30 interviews would be red. Yellow is between red and green. And then the stretch goal. The stretch goal is let's get three more guys and gals for our virtual bench. We don't have to hire, but we can at least work on the virtual bench. Okay? Now you will notice that I've got two critical numbers here. Okay? Um, I've got two critical numbers here. The first critical number is to focus and align your team. And the second one is to balance your team. Why is that? Because sometimes I've noticed uh, and, and guys, this is an advanced concept, all right? Not many of my clients use two critical numbers, but it's an advanced concept, and it's a good one. Because sometimes you push so hard on one side of the firm, you end up causing a breakage or leakage in the other side of the firm. So you want to push really hard on a critical number, and then have a second one to kind of balance you. So how do we do that? Well, like I said, it's an advanced topic. It's a pitfall. I see people sometimes working so hard on a critical number that something else broke and in the other side of the company. So what you see here is to balance people and process. So if your critical number happens to be about uh, employees, then make the second critical number of something about process on the other side. So uh, for example, if you're pushing really hard on sales, right, sales is under process, if you're pushing really hard on sales, you might want to have a second critical number that keeps your eye on customer happiness on the people side, right? Uh, if you're really pushing hard, on keep on 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 your creation of products, your make buy process. You might want to take a look at your employees as well to make sure you're not burning people out. So that's kind of that's kind of how that works. You push hard on one side, and you find another thing you can look at to help you balance 
on the other side so that you don't create a problem in your company that you know you don't want to solve a problem just to create another one. By the way, the last section of the uh, of, of the tool talks about process, and uh, I always like to say, why waste a great critical number? If you have a great critical number, it usually impacts a couple of core processes in your company, right? And and so you don't want to just get your goal. You want to also at the same time slow down a little bit and improve those core processes that is that your critical number either impacts or the core processes that actually are necessary for you to fulfill your critical number goal. So take this opportunity not to be so focused on the goal, but that you forgot about improving the habits and the process in the company as well. And so the last section here in this slide, on this, in this tool, is I want you to identify one or two processes that actually are related to your critical number. It could be that your critical number impacts it, or it could be that you have to improve those processes to achieve your critical number. So back to my second example, Hostopia. Right? Hostopia, they had to actually improve their process of website migration. Yes, the goal was how many websites can they migrate, but they actually had to work on their process, and by improving the process, they could increase the website, number of websites that they could migrate. And then they continued that habit, so that today they can, they can actually migrate 10 times what they were able to you know, a few years ago. All right? So don't waste that quarter. What do I mean by don't waste that quarter? Well, if your critical number isn't working, stop, all right, and change it. Don't be shy to say I'm wrong or we messed up. Let's change it, okay? Let's work on it. So you know it's not working if you hear the following questions or comments from your team. Uh, hey, this critical number, it isn't connected to my job. I don't get it, okay? Uh, it, it works for sales. That's great, but, but I'm in R&D. So you know what? Sales have a good time. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not connected. Another thing that you can hear, they'll tell you it's not working, is, uh, I'm sorry, what was the number again? And why do I care about it again? And by the way, I understand the number, but, but I got to pull out my HP calculator to calculate it. So it's complicated. It's a three-digit IQ critical number. Um, and then, you know, again, similar to the connected to my job, is it could be that it's connected to my job, but I don't really impact that number. Somebody else in my department impacts the number, not me. Okay? So the big pitfall here usually is I see critical numbers which are too complicated. That's the number one reason why they don't work. Uh, and critical numbers which are a combination of other numbers are big time, complex, very hard to work. So um, that's the second of the three keys, and now's a good time to take some questions. Yeah, I have a question here from uh, Katerina. It looks like uh, her question is, how do you see the use of balance scorecards mixed in with critical numbers? Okay, so that's a good question. If you're using balanced scorecard, balanced scorecard asks you to measure four areas. A little bit different format from us, but that's fine. Um, I would say that balanced scorecard gives you, uh, asks you first of all to measure four areas of, of metrics and KPIs, right? What we're saying is that um, uh, oftentimes in a, in a smaller firm, when I say smaller firm, I mean firms which are not multi-billion dollar firms, we don't have enough resources to go after four big things all at once. And so I would say, if you're using balanced scorecard, I would do the same thing. I would pick one of those areas and make that the main thing and just figure out what to do that would make huge impact in the company and get everyone behind that. Now, if you want to uh, have a minor focus on the other three things, you could, but don't have four major focuses which are pulling you in different directions in the company. Uh, typically, we don't have enough resources to do a great job there. Hey, Patrick, I got another question from Chris. He says, we're struggling with the customer happiness critical numbers that are simple to figure out. Do you have any examples? So I couldn't hear you very well, Ryan. Did you say we're struggling with customer? Yeah, customer happiness uh, critical numbers that are simple to figure out. Do you have any examples of uh, customer happiness critical numbers that are simple? Sure. So a very simple one would be out of uh, Fred Reichelt's book. The ultimate question. In the ultimate question, he talks about the net promoter score, uh, and that's that's a very simple KPI. And the thing I like about the, the NPS score is that it's also um, used by a lot of companies and is benchmarked across. So you kind of get a sense of how you line up with some of the best companies out there. Um, so, for example, Apple typically runs at about a 70 percent, 72 percent net promoter score. Uh, the one of the best of the best of the best, Harley Davidson. They run at you know between 
79 to 82%. So you kind of get a sense of what the best of the best. And if you guys have, to, if, if folks in the room have to use the Net Promoter Score, you know, typically anything north of 40, 50% is pretty good. Then one more from Robert. He asked, well, how long do I keep a critical number working? How often should I change it? So how long, how long should I, how often should I change it? Well, typically I start by saying, hey, as your benchmark, use a quarter. All right, we're, 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 typically the firms that we work with are moving very fast, so uh, a quarter is really good. Now, I would go longer if, if you know, the project or the boulder that you're undertaking is something that just cannot get done in a quarter. So, for, so I'll, I'll run the critical number maybe two quarters if I had to, to finish up that, that boulder. Um, and I wouldn't run it more than a year, by the way. You know, if you, you could run it as long as a year, but at some point, what you may want to do, even if you have the same bold that hasn't been broken down yet, you want to change your critical number, find a different lever to move that same boulder and have a different critical number. Okay, Ryan, any other questions? If not, I'm going to move on to the third key. Hold on one more here. Is it too simplistic to say that a quarter's critical number should support your company's top rock for that quarter? Um, that's, a, that's actually a very good question, and it's not too simple. In fact, I would say that um, your theme, your critical number, and your number one should all work in sync. So, for example, conversely, if you look at your top priorities for the company, and it does, has nothing to do with your critical number, then you know that your execution plan fail to address your critical number. So that's actually, yes, that's simple, good, and obvious, I know, but it's simple and good. So yes, make sure that your top number one is connected well to your critical number. Okay. I'm going to push on, Ryan. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so the third key is how do you actually use it, right? Because learning is good, but doing is better. So let's spend a few minutes on how to get your team engaged, keep them focused, aligned, and accountable. Um, we have Daniel Pink, by the way, coming to our Growth Summit uh, in October. And for those of you who haven't signed up for the Growth Summit that Vern does every year, it's awesome. And Daniel Pink talks about uh, Drive. His, his, his best selling book, Drive, is about what motivates us. And he talks about the fact that on complex and, and, and intellectual things, oftentimes the simple incentives uh, don't actually motivate us. But what actually motivates us comes down to three things, just to steal a bit of his thunder here. You have a purpose. You have autonomy and you have mastery. So if you take a look at critical number, I think you can actually uh, use your critical number to actually increase autonomy and mastery in your firm. First of all, you know, have really good success criteria, red, yellow, green, the outcomes, and then you can actually manage your team according to those outcomes and give them a lot more autonomy. And secondly, again, my emphasis on the process and skills, uh, look for mastery to improve over the processes and skills that are connected to delivering on a critical number, right? So I love the fact that a critical number can help us actually motivate our employees stronger if, if you read uh, Daniel Pink's book. The second thing is I want you to connect me about connecting your people because uh, we live in a P2P world. In fact, I was just having a coaching call this morning with one of my clients and, and we designed a really good uh, organization structure and everything else. And, and I asked the question of, okay, well, how does it affect the people? Because we live in a P2P world. Stuff does not get done automatically. Even if you did a great planning session, um, you have to connect it to my daily routine. You have to put it in my flight path. So there's two simple ways of putting this in my flight path. The first is to create a daily question that's about the critical number. So for example, back to the firm that was hiring 14 people. If, if their goal was to get 42, their critical number was to get 42 people in the final interviews, their daily question could be, what am I doing today to help get 42 people or how many people left into our, our final interview process, all right? So just create a very simple daily question that you can ask in your daily huddle. Secondly, discuss this in your weekly meeting, all right? How are you doing on a critical number? So I always ask my friends, you know, why is your critical number a secret? Because I sometimes would go and ask the rest of the company, I'll say, hey, guys, do you know what the critical number is this quarter? And outside the executive team, unfortunately, sometimes, oftentimes, I get the, I don't know what you're talking about answer. So, you know, if you have 100 brains in your company working for you, I would love for you to use all 100 brains. So don't make a critical number a secret, you know. 
uh, use it with your, with your employees and your associates. Make sure that they use it daily, ask themselves daily what they can do to impact it. And, and maybe they can't, I'm not asking them to do something special for the curriculum number every single day. I'm just saying to use it as your daily question helps them keep it top of mind, will help them see more ideas to help, to help you. So uh, make sure that people know your critical number. Now, uh, for our rhythm clients or in the audience, you can do something a little bit different as well. Uh, if, you're, if you're a rhythm client, then you're using the dashboard system and coaching. What I'll suggest you do is you talk to your execution coach about this and you can create a custom dashboard in rhythm so that, that, that you can actually um, um, track and, and manage your critical numbers. So in this one example, I would say the critical number here is number of people on the virtual bench, right? It's about hiring. And so this company would say, okay, we're hiring so hard, I want to make sure that we're not forgetting to do our customer visits and sales. So let's use that as our second critical number. Let's create a custom dashboard and use both, both critical numbers on the, on the custom dashboard. And then you can see the little graphic I have here about balancing, right, people, uh, people and process. So in this case, uh, recruiting was by employees, and we balanced it with sales, right, make sure my sales process is happening. They were not so focused on hiring that we forgot to sell. So that's how you use the two critical numbers. And I think I love about simple, simple red, yellow, green dashboards like this, the, uh, the red and yellow squares when they light up, those are what, uh, what we call action triggers to help us take, take a corrective action fast and immediately. So whether you use this dashboard or use some other dashboard, a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, so make it visual and make it a constant reminder. And so, uh, you know, at least have these dashboards up publicly and and at least in your weekly meeting, make sure you're talking about your dashboards and reviewing them. One of my favorite books by Chip and Dan Heath, uh, a, a year or so ago, half a, a year and a half ago, I think we introduced it to our client base. Um, he talks about having a path of progress, and you want to show progress towards success. You want to, first of all, be able to record your small wins, make sure that your team understands the whole path, it's a, get a sense of the big picture, and then you want to teach the numbers, okay? What, how do you impact the critical numbers? And by the way, this is way before this book was written. Imagine this, right? It's amazing. But this is exactly what Jack Stack did to fix his problems. He actually focused on getting a series of small wins. He then made sure his people had this, a sense of the big picture. And then he taught on the numbers. He taught on what those financial numbers meant. How do you actually impact a, a debt to equity ratio? What were the other sub numbers that impacted that? So he taught on the numbers as well. And with this path of progress, they were able to succeed. A um, couple last things, uh, oftentimes people get stuck. People get stuck. I see this happen all the time. It happens to me all the time too. You get stuck. How do you know you're stuck, by the way? You know you're stuck only if you're statusing every single week. You go to status every single week. Imagine if you're stuck and you status every single month. You could go four weeks stuck with no help and then you status, right? So status every single week. And how do you know you're stuck? Well, if you're red or that project or, or, or priority uh, that, that goes towards the critical number is red with no action plan for more than one week, more than one red square, you know you're stuck. You know you need to slow down and ask more questions. By the way, I don't know if you ever noticed this, but when I'm stuck and someone slows down and says to me, Patrick, I've got five ideas for you, that actually makes me more stuck versus because I get freaked out a little bit and my ego comes up and, and I get, no, 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 I can figure this out. No, I can't figure this out. That's why I'm stuck. So instead, Again, go back to Liz Wiseman book, ask questions. I know that person's stuck, but ask questions. Give that person some talk time and some questions, and believe me, either that person will get him or herself unstuck, or you'll be very helpful to getting them unstuck. So have the discussion conversations and get unstuck every week. Otherwise, uh, your critical number won't work by itself automatically. Okay, so today I covered three keys. Um, and uh, I also covered uh, this, this tool that, I, that I've given everybody. And so please go ahead and down, download this tool. I'll be blogging on this topic as well, a little bit more on critical number. So if you're interested, you can read my blog. Uh, it's at you know, patentian.com, also at gazellesystems.com. And you can also subscribe as well. I'll blog once or twice a week. Um, one of our clients was very thankful when our marketing director uh, suggested she register her for, 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 the, web, for, for the blog. And so she gets the blog delivered via email now. So if you feel like you want us to register you, we'll be happy to 
go the second mile and register you so you don't even have to go there and register yourself. So you can let us know when the survey comes up, uh, comes up next. Um, but to really summarize really quickly and see if there are any other questions before our hour is up is uh, the three keys that we went over today was to make it about the main thing, make it a leading indicator, and then I gave you a number of tips on how to actually use your critical number because learning's good, but doing is better. So the next step, so if you don't have a next step, then all we would have done is entertain you over lunch and nothing would have happened. So I'd like you guys to decide, commit right now, set a date for your Q4 planning. For those of you who haven't done that yet, go ahead and set a date for planning with your team and, and make sure that uh, you use your critical numbers. So, you know, 60% of the people in the audience use critical numbers. Let's get it to 100%. Um, and 60% uh, uh, use the Rockefeller Habits one-page plan. If you need more information on that, email us and we'll help you with that as well. Any questions, Ryan? Yeah, I've got a question here from, from Dave. Dave asked, uh, for the two critical numbers in the two um, uh, categories, what would the, the three people and three process categories, again, So right here, under the people, we have employees, customers, and shareholders. And under uh, process, we have make, buy, sell, and keeping good records. By the way, if you use the one-page strategic plan, if you don't, you can just download it from our site, and if you don't want to use it. But up top, up top of the one-page strategic plan, are the uh, six categories of key performance indicators. Three on the left side are people. Three on the right side are process. So if you're using a one-page plan, it's actually on your one-page plan. Thank you, Patrick. And Cynthia is asking, how do I use the critical number in my weekly meeting? Can you give me an example of that? Okay, so um, using a critical number on a weekly basis in your weekly meeting. I would start by making sure that everyone has a view of the force. So guys, this, is, this quarter, it's about X. Remind everyone what the main thing is, okay? And then, by the way, our critical number to get the main thing done is why, right? And then let's talk about uh, how we're doing on that. Uh, is anybody doing anything this week to actually impact critical number? Oh, oh, by the way, last week, did we have any victories on this critical number? So that's what I'll do. And I won't make it a super long discussion. I, I have maybe a 10-minute discussion because you've got other things to talk about as well. But that little 10-minute discussion will focus and align your team for the rest of the week on the critical number. And I got one more question from Mike. Mike asks, do you have more examples of critical numbers that drive sales? Examples of critical numbers that drive sales. So um, yeah. I can give you one or two real quick. You know, oftentimes, again, uh, when you look at sales and sales isn't moving, the question is, why isn't your sales moving? And, and I think the critical number is different for every single company's sales process and every company's sales challenges. So for example, if, 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 um, if a company A may think that uh, they can tell that by the number of meetings they have, it drives sales, then I would focus on number of meetings as a critical number versus the sales revenue, right? Company B may say, well, you know, we are, we are internet click kind of a business and, and it's based on the number of, of uh, traffic and hits that we get on Google search, fine. Make that the critical number. But what you don't want to do, a pitfall, is to make the sales result, the revenue goal, a critical number. Because just like my friend with the cash problem, staring at the revenue goal doesn't really help you get there. Trying to figure out what actually is the lever that pushes the revenue goal will be more helpful. So things in your sales process. Take a look at your sales process. Uh, understand which are the bottlenecks in your sales process or which are the key points in your sales process or sales funnel. And when you push on, you get the result you're looking for. And then make that what the critical number is about. Well, thanks, Patrick. That's all the uh, time we have today for questions. I see some more questions coming in. We'll do the best we can to answer those uh, offline for you via, via email and uh, get you some answers to those questions. Uh, so this concludes our webcast for today. We hope you'll join us for our next webcast on October 14th at 1 o'clock Eastern time. And we'll discuss how to create and effective annual plan for 2012, for 2012. Thanks so much, Patrick, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Please help us by taking uh, 30 seconds to give us some feedback on the webcast after it completes. You'll see a screen that pops up when you leave the webcast uh, asking you a couple of uh, simple questions to help us uh, get some feedback. The webcast was recorded.
and you'll receive a link to the recording as soon as it is available. So thanks again, Patrick, and thank you all for joining us today, and we hope you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.